Alright, today is Wednesday, the 1st of March. This is a recap for the stock market activities today. Now folks, I got a good one for you tonight. We're starting fresh, a new month. Whatever happened last month, that's in the past now. The bloodbath that we got last month, it's it's behind us now. And we have to look ahead, maybe for a new bloodbath. But anyways, let's begin with uh, some comments from the viewers. The viewer says, I think you're overestimating the Fed's powers. They can't stop a recession. It's too late. Actually, I think what they do is mostly a ritual that does very little. Now my friend, I think you're gonna like this video tonight because this is exactly what we're going to talk about. Now, can the Fed prevent a recession? The answer is at this point, at this stage, really hard to see. It's almost close to impossible. Now, if you're talking about overestimating the Fed's power in taking inflation down, I disagree. I think they still have the power to do that. Their tools are really powerful. If they raise rates where it needs to be to become restrictive to this inflation, they will take it down. If they do the right thing, you bet they will take inflation down. It's not going to be an easy battle, but they will win. The problem is at what cost? Here comes the conversation of it has to be a recession. So the recession is inevitable, it's unavoidable, and the Fed can and will defeat inflation, but the cost will be a massive recession. Here's another comment from the viewer. Thank you for uh, pointing out this. I think I made a mistake yesterday. I slipped and I said that 72% of credit card debt was accumulated last year. Now that would be uh, historic. That would be a disaster because if that's true, that means $720 billion were added to credit card debt last year alone. So I hope that viewer understood what I was trying to say, which is 72% of credit card holders added to debt during last year. And almost half of them say we did that because of inflation. We have to keep up with inflation. Now, before we start, I want to talk about the breaking news that we got today. By now, you might have heard that the Senate already overturned the federal rule on ESG investment, which basically means that BlackRock, when they manage your uh, retirement fund, your uh, pension or whatever, they have to be woke. They have to consider ESG investment and avoid investment investing in oil and gas, etc, etc. Now we know Biden is going to veto all of this. My take is when I give BlackRock or Fidelity my uh, retirement money, I want you to give me the best returns. I don't want you to be woke and do ESG and all that crap. Just give me the best returns so I can retire comfortably. Now the hottest sector of the market by far since 2020 has been energy. In this channel, we said that the election of Joe Biden will be the best thing that ever happened to oil companies. And this is exactly what happened. I know personally, a lot of viewers in this channel thank me and they say, hey, back in 2020, when you said buy uh, Exxon Mobil, when nobody wanted to buy Exxon, when the dividend was at 10%, well, I did that and now I'm retiring. It's over. It's done. Better than BlackRock, baby. But what are the implications in the market based on this decision? The answer is not a lot because it's going to be vetoed. But can we see some volatility in uh, some of the hottest uh, green energy sectors of the market, such as solar, for example? Maybe they go down now. Maybe we see some of the names that folks were not buying, such as Energy, Chevron, Exxon this year. Maybe they will start to catch a bit. That could be an impact for now. But the news all in all is a nothing burger for now because Biden is going to veto it. We know that. But it's going to become a hot topic in 24. So we have to keep an eye on it. And specifically BlackRock stock. Are we going to see a backlash? from certain major pension funds, retirement funds, we'll see. Lastly, before we move on to the In Focus segment, I think right now that the biggest threat to the stock market is not the Fed, not Russia, Ukraine, not China, not any of that. The biggest threat right now is the competition from the bond market. Look at the one-year yield, for example. It's giving you 5%. That is risk-free. Now, understand this. If you're in your late 50s, 60s, if you come to me and say, hey, what do I do right now? I would say right away, park your money in the one-year, the two-year, get the 5% risk-free. Don't gamble in the stock market at all. And a lot of money managers will do the same. What are the implications of all of that? Think about the dividend cohort in the stock market right now. A lot of them are value stocks, but recently they've been getting hit really hard because why would I take the risk and buy, even if it is a solid company, by the way, but why would I take the risk and, you know, buy a stock at this stage to get three, three and a half percent dividend, which is really good when I can get 5% plus risk-free. And I think this is why you're seeing a lot of pain specifically in the value cohort, in the dividend cohort, and soon enough even for growth. Why would anybody take the risk when you have a better alternative? Are we going to start to see the impact of this being magnified in the next weeks and next months to come? So keep an eye on that. But with that out of the way, let's move on to the main topic of tonight's program. And here it is, in focus tonight. <laughs> 
panic. That's what's happening among central banks right now. The cabal of central banks is panicking. Why? Because they're losing the battle against inflation. It's getting out of hand now. It's getting out of control. Not just in the Fed here in the US, but also in Japan, in Europe, in Australia, in New Zealand, all over the place. It's not just because they were way behind the curve and now they're catching up. Now we have another bomb that just dropped on the top of their heads called the China reopening, which means now China that is uh, coming out out of the zombie apocalypse. They want to buy oil. They want to buy copper. They want to buy gold, lumber, coffee, meats, grains, lots of catching up to do. And this will push inflation higher. More demand on commodities, higher inflation. And today we got the news that China factory activities reached the highest level in 11 years. Now, look, you want to believe this news or disbelieve it, that's up to you. But the headline is going to move these markets. And immediately, the moment we got this headline, the Australian dollar shot up higher. The New Zealand Kiwi shot up higher. And in reaction to that, the US dollar moved down. Now, when we talk about AI and they're going to replace humanity and the AI is the new thing, bullshit. You want to know how intelligent AI is? They're actually stupid. Look no further than the algorithms for the stock market. That's AI. But the algos look at the dollar going down. What do they do? Immediately, they start buying stocks. We see US stock futures shooting up higher. But this is not a good piece of data. This means that inflation will move higher and the Fed here in the US will have to raise rates even further and tighten the monetary policy even further, which means we should be seeing a higher dollar. But because of other currencies moving higher, the dollar went down. The algos, they're not intelligent enough to distinguish between all of that. In any case, whether you believe the data from China or not, it's not just China. We have many Asian countries right now and we're seeing that manufacturing is making a comeback, which means more demand from Asian economies, more activities, higher commodities prices, and more inflation. Now, I am skeptical about the whole China reopening thing. And today, Robin Brooks floated this theory and it is interesting. He says that the China reopening boom is a mirage because the manufacturing data, the headline reading shows you one thing, but when you dig into details, you realize that we have a problem with delivery delivery times. Delivery times are moving down big time. Maybe this is an indicator that the whole China reopening thing is just an overhype. Now, my skepticism about the China reopening is, number one, I believe that demand will come back from China, but it will come back from a government level. The government will demand more oil, more gas, more lumber, more copper, more resources, and that's inflationary. But Wall Street, of course, the geniuses that they are, they also believe that there is a pent-up demand from the Chinese consumer. And now that they have the reopening, the, the Chinese consumer, that is, they will go splurging and buy Nike shoes and spend at Starbucks stores and buy Tesla and watch Disney movies. And all of this is good for our stocks. I disagree. I think the Chinese consumer's behavior is different than the Western and specifically the US consumer. They're not going to go splurging. Certain segments will. Maybe that's good for luxury retail, for example. But the majority of the Chinese consumer will not splurge. So this is the worst outcome because companies' revenues will not improve. What's going to improve is commodities prices, meaning higher inflation. So that's my take about the China reopening. But folks, when the rains it pours, and today we got shocking news from Germany. Germany. Not shocking to me, but shocking to the geniuses, of course. The headline reads, German inflation unexpectedly accelerates in February. Unexpectedly? Anyways, look at this. This is insane. German inflation at almost 10%. Yes, it went down. Now it's rebanded. Maybe it's going to make a higher high. The ECB is way behind the curve. No wonder why we have these false signals of the German DAX shooting up higher. Almost back to the highs, which means the ECB has to be extra aggressive at this point to send the memo. Otherwise, this inflation will get out of hand. The German central bank president said that stubborn inflation will remain at a very high level. So this is going to be a problem for the German economy for a long time. What is the heart and the backbone of any economy? The answer is the consumer. If the German consumer is getting choked by higher utility bills, by higher housing bills, higher bills at the grocery store, how the hell are they supposed to stimulate corporate earnings? And it's not just in Germany. Look at what's going on in the UK. Grocery bills in the UK reaching a startling 17% inflation rate. French, Spanish consumer prices also surprising to the upside. Central banks across the globe losing the battle against inflation. It's getting out of their control now. Why and how did we get here? The answer is weakness, indecisiveness. And why are central banks too weak? The answer is they're beholden to their sponsors. 
the oligarchs, the banksters, and they want higher stock prices and higher real estate prices. So central banks are too afraid. God forbid the stock market might go down if we do the job to take inflation down. God forbid the real estate values of the oligarchs will go down if we do the job. But who cares about the mid-class, regular folks paying 17% inflation rate at the grocery store? And we know these are the cooked data, of course. In reality, the bills are much higher. And now that the battle is getting out of control, central banks will have to come back with more aggression. They have no other choice. The population is getting mad. Inflation is killing us. Inflation is a chokehold on the middle class. Inflation has destroyed the American dream. If you happen to be a millennial, a Gen Zer, good luck owning a home. You'll be in your 80s before you own a home. And now Bank of America is warning that the Fed will hike rates to the point of pain, as experts say that there is no serious signs that the economy is under control. They're losing the battle again. They're behind the curve again. And they have to come out with more aggression. More aggression means higher severity in the degree of recession because we're now in stagflation. We talked about this in uh, last night's video in details. The economy continues to weaken. More rate hikes at this point will damage the economy more. But what other choice do they have at this point? When you got inflation sticky and the economy is deteriorating on the other hand, you gotta concentrate on the inflation part and take that inflation down, which means more and more and more damage to this economy. And Bank of America now says that the Fed policy rate will go to 6%. Last year, when I said that they have to go above the CPI, meaning 6% plus, people accused me of being an alarmist. People accused me of being a conspiracy theorist. Well, now you know what I was talking about last year. Even Bank of America now says that we have to go 6% plus. Because look at what happened in the morning. We got the ISM manufacturing data for the month of February. The reading is slightly higher, up from 47.4 last month to 47.7. And you can see that the direction is contracting. New orders, contracting. Production, contracting. Employment, contracting. What's increasing? The answer is, how about prices? Shockingly high. The last reading was 44.5. Now we're back to positive territory. 51.3. Increasing. The moment we got this piece of data, the dollar shot up higher, and equities went down big. Because this is stagflation, folks. Prices continue to move higher. The pace of economic activity contracting, slowing down. Yet you have geniuses and propagandists such as uh, Paul Krugman, who says there is no stagflation. Stagflation is just for alarmists. They're trying to scare you. And now they know that it's getting out of hand. The Fed, central banks, they know. They're losing again. And we got calls today from Boystick from Atlanta and Kashkari from Minneapolis describing inflation as concerning and calling for higher rates. The problem is, you know, Kashkari is one of those people who used to be ultra dovish. He believed in the casino model of the economy. Just keep printing on steroids, pump the stock market higher, who cares? And there are no consequences at all. Who cares if uh, the monetary policy benefits the rich and crushes the poor and the middle class? We don't care. Now all of a sudden he's becoming hawkish again. But he remains delusional, folks. Even Neil Kashkari, which is the only hope we got right now, even Neil is still delusional. And it reflects the group think uh, mentality at the Fed. Listen to his delusion talking about a soft landing. He's still hoping for a soft landing. Anybody who knows the history about inflation and the monetary policy knows that there is no such thing as soft landing. The soft landing is a fantasy. Every inflation cycle ended up in a recession. He knows that. He's going to tell you that. But before he does that, he's going to sell you a fantasy. Take a look. Uh, so there, some people said there may be a cliff of multifamily is going to build a lot this year and then really unclear what happens in 24. But the services economy continues to be very strong. We're not yet seeing much of a sign of our interest rate increases slowing down the services side of the economy. And that is concerning to me. So ultimately, where do we want to do? We want to achieve what's called a soft landing. We raise interest rates. We tap the brakes in the economy. We gently bring the economy back down to 2% inflation environment. Think about the economy that we had just before the pandemic hit. We had low inflation. We had low unemployment. We had healthy growth. It was a pretty good economy. That's what we want to get back to. The challenge, of course, is typically when the central bank raises interest rates to cool down inflation, most of the time it leads to a recession. And so that's, we, you know, we would like to avoid a recession but we know we have to get inflation down. Getting inflation down is job one. So he says, yeah, we're aiming for the soft landing, but job number one is getting inflation down. Well, if job number one is getting inflation down, the only way you're going to get inflation down is by producing a recession. You know that, but he still want to sell you a fantasy here. And if the fantasy is not the soft landing, it's the aftermath of the recession, according to Neil. Oh, the recovery is going to be 
quick, boom, we go down, then we go up again. Take a look. Now, whether we can achieve the soft landing, the answer is I don't know. Uh, the, the track record is not good in being able to slow down the economy this much without going a little too far and heading into recession. But the, the dynamics are different. We have supply chains that are getting better. We do have families that have strong balance sheets. We do have states that have strong balance sheets. There are a lot of really healthy things going on in the US economy right now that give me some optimism. But at the same time, we know we need to get inflation back down. So I don't know the answer to that. I will say, typically when the central bank has caused a recession by raising interest rates, the bounce back can be very fast. Now that's delusional because every time we get a crash and then we get a quick recovery, it happened because the Fed used the plunger to rescue the economy. This time around, we're paying, pay attention now, we're paying for the rescue mission of 2009. All what we've done, folks, is just kick the can down the road. Now we have to pay the bill. Now we have to pay the price. And who's going to pay the price? The answer is, how about the Gen Zers? They got no future now. So when he says, oh, we're going to recover fast after the recession, that's yet another fantasy. You know that, Neil, because this this time around, the Fed will not be able to re-stimulate the economy. This is going to be a major shock, perhaps a lost decade, because we have to pay for the bill from the past. And here is the delusion part. After all of the data that we've gotten so far this year, indicating that inflation is moving higher, not just in this country, in Europe in Japan, in Australia, in New Zealand, all over the place. You'd think that Neil Kashkari got the memo and he's going to go with the 50 instead of 25 in the next meeting. Going to 25 was a mistake. We thought that Neil got it. In the next meeting, he's going to go with 50, maybe more. But again, here's the problem. They want to play these uh, monkey games and oh, maybe we shouldn't uh, go to 50. Maybe we should still do 25 and then concentrate on the dot plots to send uh, a psychological signal to the market that we're bluffing. Oh, maybe we're going to do more. Watch market we're going to do more take a look at our models understanding the inflation were not working because of these dynamics are so unique we realized we just had to get aggressive and catch up so we were not falling further behind so we raised rates for 75 basis point moves in a row then downshifted to 50 then downshifted to 25 and so there's a lot of attention to the next meeting in March is it going to be 25 or is it going to be 50 I'm open-minded at this point about whether it's 25 or 50 basis points to me much what's much more important than whether it's 25 or 50 is what we signal in what's called the dot plot so every three months every participant in the FOMC put writes down on a piece of paper a projection of what we think optimal monetary policy looks like and because markets are forward-looking this signal about where we think rates are headed actually contains a lot of really important information. Now, this is a stupid way of thinking because the market right now is in a cocaine addict mentality. Not just the market, but the economy, the consumer. Same story. The moment they see any opening, any weakness that the Fed might pivot, might reduce rates, might pause, they're going to go bananas and inflation will come back. Actions speak louder than words. You want to shock inflation down? You got to start by shocking the consumer, the economy, and the market. And you do that by going back to 50 basis points, if not above. But this cute game of, oh, we're going to do 25 and then up the dot plots, and that'll do the job, that's another mistake, Neil. Inflation is going to rebound even higher. The market will get the wrong signal. We're going to see another impulsive rally in the equities market. Bond yields going down. Everybody assuming that the Fed will um, wimp out, as Dr. Rubini said. This is the equivalent of uh, Jerome Powell saying disinflation 15 times in the last FOMC. But again, maybe Neil doesn't even care about financial conditions. He doesn't care if the stock market goes higher in an impulsive fashion, meme stocks, garbage, SPACs, and a severe loosening of financial conditions. Take a look. There is this, in Wall Street, this institutional cultural exuberance that just at any moment, they're looking for an excuse to get excited. And then all of a sudden, they get all excited again with one little piece of good news. I don't overpay too much attention to stock market gyration. Stock, the stock market goes up, stock market goes down. I don't really care. Now, remember when we talked about the underlying conditions of inflation? You got to defeat those before you take inflation down. And we have a disinflation process in the economy, a legitimate one. One of those underlying conditions is financial conditions. Financial conditions have to tighten and stay tight for a long time before inflation is defeated. We're not even a tight territory, as I showed you in last night's video. Financial conditions right now are looser than 21. You think you're going to beat inflation when you have financial 
financial conditions looser than 21. And you wonder why the Fed is losing the battle against inflation? Because we have incompetent fools leading the Fed. Another important thing in defeating inflation, the Fed must be proactive, not reactive. We've been talking about this for a long time now. You gotta get ahead of inflation. You gotta grab the steering wheel from inflation and say, look, I'm in charge now. I will take you down. I'm gonna raise rates above the rate of inflation and take inflation and got it down. Not the other way around. I'm not gonna be chasing inflation, but leave it to the Fed once again, continuing to be reactive, not proactive. Here's Neil once again. We've got another inflation reading yet to come. We have another job report yet to come before the meeting. Ultimately, that will inform me. But I think the bottom line is, I think where the dots end up is going to be much more important than whether we uh, raise by 25 or 50 at the next meeting. So Neil wants to wait for the data to show him that inflation is moving higher again so he can uh, play catch up once again. I say, oh, okay, maybe we shouldn't do 25. We'll just go with the 50 now. And then inflation goes higher again. Oh, whoops, we got to go with 75. How about you just guide inflation down? How about you do what Volcker did? Raise above the inflation rate, take inflation down, and then you can cut rates again. You know that. He knows that. He knows that the risk of under tightening is a lot worse than the risk of over tightening. Take a listen. So there is a risk, given those lags, of over-tightening because we are continuing to pay attention to the inflation. But I will just tell you, from my seat, the risk of underdoing it is a much graver risk for the U.S. economy than the risk of over-tightening. Because if, in the worst scenario, we didn't do our jobs, and inflation expectations became unanchored, and they became embedded in the fabric of our economy, then we would have to raise rates dramatically to break that psychology and bring them back down. That's what happened in the 1970s. And so I think my colleagues agree with me that the risk of uh, under tightening is the worse risk than the risk of over tightening. If we over tighten, we will ultimately see it and we'll be able to respond to it and adjust to that. Um, but the risk of under tightening potentially has much longer duration uh, uh, concerns that would come with that. And perhaps here's a sobering message from former Fed Governor Mishkin, who explains in details why the pause, the pivot, the uh, wishy-washy action, the weakness by the Fed is very, very dangerous. Take a look. Some people will say it's because the banks will raise interest rates for too long, go too far. As some people are arguing, our central bank is doing right now. There are people calling for a pause, saying wait and look around and see the lag effect before you continue to raise rates uh, at, at, a, at additional paces. Um, what, what do you say back to that? Uh, I, th this is super dangerous thinking. So uh, uh, one of the things we look at in the paper is uh, we look at a, a situation which had a lot of parallels now, which was the Volcker disinflation. Uh, and many people, you know, Volcker's a huge hero. Uh, many people don't really remember what went on there. The Federal Reserve, when, in October 79, after Volcker uh, became chair, uh, raised interest rates to very high levels, uh, and 17% uh, actually was pretty high level. Uh, and then a recession started and they backed off. Uh, the result was that inflation did not come down, expected inflation did not come down. Uh, and in fact, uh, 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 th there was no ability to control inflation. The Fed had lost its credibility and now weakened it. Uh, but to Volcker's the credit, he then realized that this was a mistake. And then the Fed really took out the baseball bat clobbered heads big time, raised uh, federal funds rate to over 20 percent. Uh, and then finally, it, it took several years of very high interest rates then to get inflation down. So uh, it is super dangerous thinking to think that the Fed should pivot, uh, that uh, when central banks have done that, they haven't completed their job, they lose credibility. And particularly important is when you've actually gotten behind the curve, you have to reestablish credibility and therefore you have to be tough. Now, it's true that you might go too far. Central banking, by the way, is not an easy business. It's, uh, there's a lot of art to it. There is science. Uh, you know, uh, economists have contributed to that science of monetary policy, but a lot is art. And so you never quite get it perfect. But on the other hand, uh, thinking that you need to back off because you're too worried about a recession 
is what produces much worse recessions than otherwise occur. So he gave us the example of how Volcker raised rates, then inflation cooled down by a little bit, and then Volcker backed off. Of course, he backed off because there was a lot of pressure saying, hey, you're doing too much. So he listened to the morons. That's his mistake. He listened to the morons and he backed off. And what happened? Inflation came back with more aggression. And then Volcker said, okay, you fools had your time. You had your chance in taking this inflation down. Now shut up and listen to me. And he raised rates aggressively, double digits above the inflation rate. And he got the job done. And this is the art part of uh, central banking. You see, the geniuses follow what the other economists and other geniuses say. Just follow the book. Sometimes the book doesn't work when it comes to economics. A lot of economics is art. And art Art comes from psychology. A huge part of defeating inflation is the psychological battle. When Volcker raised rates above the inflation rate and said, enough, I'm done here, I'm not going to play games anymore, message received. The Fed is no longer playing games. But with this weak Fed that we have, everybody knows they're playing games. They're not serious about taking inflation down. And this is why inflation refuses to go down, because it has a weak opponent. And again, the argument goes, but Maverick, what about the recession? Do you really want the Fed to go ahead and be aggressive and push this economy into a recession because we have a great economy right now why would you destroy that my rebuttal is this is not a great economy this is a shitty economy number one number two the recession is inevitable it's gonna happen with or without the fed but if the fed does it it's gonna be a lot milder than if it happens organically if it happens organically it might be a depression folks at this point listen to former governor Michigan again one of the things we did is we looked at the hi history and then we actually did some economic modeling and the history says, you look at 16 uh, 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 cases of where central banks actually tightened uh, interest rates when, in fact, they had to get inflation down. And this is in many countries, not just the U.S. In every single case, you got a recession. Uh, and so, uh, you know, maybe this time is different, but uh, that's usually uh, dangerous thinking. So just on that basis alone, uh, the likelihood of a recession is extremely high. And this is particularly true also from a, a, a economic theory viewpoint, when a central bank gets behind the curve, as the Fed certainly did, they made a, they made a, a bunch of mistakes, uh, particularly in 2021, which as you might know, I've been on CNBC uh, since April of 2021, being very critical of the Fed on this. When you get behind the curve, in order to get inflation back under control, you have to raise rates a lot, and in fact, you inevitably have a recession. And here it is. Bingo. Why don't we be honest with the American public and say, look, to defeat inflation, we're going to have a recession. It's inevitable. It's in the bag. It's going to happen. It is your job right now, the public, to start preparing for this recession. Pay your credit card debt, decrease whatever liabilities that you cannot afford if you lose your job, the stupid auto loan that you took that you're paying $1,000 a month for a shitty car. Maybe you don't need that. Why not do that instead of lying to the public repeatedly and sell us this fantasy of a soft landing and now the new one, no landing. What kind of stupidity is this? And folks, I hear from some of you every single day in the comments saying, hey Maverick, today I lost my job. It is heartbreaking. It happened to me before. It happened to a lot of you before. It feels that the world just collapsed on the top of your head. And I feel for you. My heart goes out for you. But the same people also say thank you so much for getting me ready to lose my job, for telling me the truth that my job is not in the bank. I paid my credit card debt a few months ago. I got rid of my financial obligations that I can't really afford if I lose my job. And now I'm looking for another opportunity. This is what we should be doing right now, folks, preparing the public for the inevitable, which is a recession. And with that out of the way, let's move on to cover the stock market information for you. We begin with the closing of the indices today. And uh, here we go. The Dow closing the day positive by 5.14 points or a gain of 0.02%. Now the expectations are the Dow is going to open positive and this is due to Salesforce. Uh, I believe it was up 15, 17% after hours. The Dow Jones is a price weighted index. So Salesforce will do the job and push the Dow higher. But it could be a different story for the Nasdaq and the S&P. Today, the Nasdaq closed negative by 76.06 points or a decline of 0.66%. The S&P was also negative by 18.76 points or a decline of 0.47%. We'll look at the sectors. At number one, capturing the gold metal, materials. Number two, for the silver, energy. Number three, for the bronze, industrials. On the other hand, the laggards of the day led by utilities, real estate, and technology. Now, we know when rates go higher, we just talked about 
about the one year paying you 5%. Why would you even buy utilities? Not going to happen. Why would you buy real estate? But when the recession happens, when we get into the recession phase, bond yields will collapse. And then we're going to go back to utilities and real estate. But we're not there yet. Keyword yet. When it comes to the breadth, the uh, advanced and decline ratios, NYSE 48% advancing versus 51% declining. The NASDAQ 41% advancing versus 56% declining. We're still within the neutral line here. The market hasn't made a move yet. Keyword yet. But that's about to come. On to commodities. Today we got a double tailwind. Number one coming from the hot data from China. Immediately we see energy commodities moving higher. We see copper shooting up higher. Grains shooting up higher. But on top of that, the dollar did close negative for the day. So it is no surprise we have uh, mostly green activities across the board for energy, for uh, metals, for grains. Even the majority of softs closed positive. The exception being the recent winners. The ones rallying along with the equities market. Mostly lumber. Lumber down about 5%. And again, lumber has a good degree of uh, correlation between with the stock market, I should say. So when lumber moves down, is the leading indicator that the equities market is going to move down and vice versa. Just keep that in mind. Pull a chart of lumber along with the chart of the Qs or the SPY. You can see the correlation right before your eyes. But again, among the losers, OJ futures down about 4%. Massive rally year to date. So it's just a pullback for now. And the same goes for coffee down about one and a quarter percent. Moving on to the big casino, the options market, what do we see here? The volume yet again cooling down a bit. The majority of the action is now in the zero date till expiration. Absolute stupidity. Insane stuff that we're seeing right now. But regardless, at number one, the hottest stable by far is Tesla. With about one and a half million contracts traded today, about 60% of those were calls. Lots of anticipation of the uh, revelations of, uh, what is it now? master plan which is another hype by the way like battery day ev day ai day and last time i checked tesla's down about five percent or so after hours this is a bust it's uh buy the rumor sell the news we could see an oversized reaction and the reason is the market maker no longer needs all of these shares that they've been buying now that the call options buyers are going to bail out we're going to see more buying of puts we could see an oversized reaction here in tesla we're going to talk more about tesla and the heat map and the charts analysis but for now amazon at number two with around 1 million contracts traded today and look at this about 60 percent of those were puts not calls and then we have apple at number three with around uh, 800 000 contracts traded today about 50 50 between calls and puts now when we look at the spx volume the zero day till expiration phenomenon you can see right away the 24 hours less than 24 hours column shooting up significantly higher since q3 of last year and this is a major problem a lot of folks are gambling using zero day till expiration options not just among the retail mom and pops but now the institutionals are doing the same this is absolutely reckless and the problem for all of this is we're gonna repeat the volume get in phenomenon look for example at the front delta now what does that mean delta is the sensitivity rate for a particular option when it moves up or down by a dollar or so front delta let's say you have an expiration date this Friday, major expiration date, monthly, weekly, etc. But then you have front delta from shorter expiration dates. We talked about the market maker, aka the dealer. They receive feedback based on the options market activities. Now we have three parts that move markets every single day. You got the fundamentals, that's the lion's share. I would say about 50% in the long run at least. And then we have the other 50 divided between technicals and mechanics. This is the mechanics. The dealer gets the feedback from the options market activities, usually the weekly or even better the monthly expiration and therefore during monthly expirations we see the phenomenon of max pain well for example if folks been stampeding buying call options in a certain security the market maker has to hedge by buying the underlying share of that particular security but comes the monthly expiration now the market maker has to look at all of these options and if they expire in the money the dealer loses money so they want to make sure that all of these options expire out of the money at least most of them so what do they do now they have the power because they've been buying buying all of these shares. In the case of a gamma squeeze induced via a stampede of buying call options, the dealer has the option now of dumping all of these shares and pushing prices down to make sure that the majority of call options expire worthless. But what if we have a day-to-day -day phenomenon until expiration date where folks are sending uh, false feedback to the market maker because they're gambling on those zero-to-date expiration options. They buy the 4,000 calls in the SPX, for example. Then they buy the 3,900 puts for the SPX. 
SPX back and forth, back and forth every single day. Now the market maker received a lot of um, false feedback. A lot of the moves that they've done in buying uh, certain security or the index or dumping them, all of this was built on false feedback done via gambling. So when we get to the options expiration, we see more volatility because now the market maker has to do more adjustments. And so far, we've been seeing front delta giving us the same readings, if not more than the crash of March 2020, the crash of 2018, and the famous volume getting phenomenon in February 2018. Something big is going to happen, folks. Buckle up. On to the unusual activities that took place in the options market today. We begin with the ticker SLB for SLB. Lots of call options buying as of late. And here's another one. Somebody bought the 58 calls for the expiration date, March 17th. We had expectations that the SLB will move higher and gain more than 5.5% by then. They paid around 55 cents a piece to enter. This trade, all in all, spending around $1.3 million. And then we have the ticker MGM for MGM. Now, between DraftKings and MGM, I'd go with MGM due to the valuations. I would not even consider MGM as a competitor to Las Vegas Sands or Win. I'm going to talk about those two in a minute. But a lot of the recent optimism for MGM is happening due to BetMGM, the gambling app, and this is the growth engine of the company right now. We have somebody betting that the name will move higher and they bought the 47 calls for the expiration date March 31st with expectations that MGM will move higher and add gains north of 6% by the expiration date. They paid around 70 cents a piece to enter this trade all in all spending around $1 million. And here it is, LVS, Las Vegas Sands. Somebody buying calls betting for higher prices to come for the name. This is due to China reopening optimism, yada yada. If you've been watching the channel for a while, you know that I like win over LVS. And the reason is Las Vegas remains hot. We know that Las Vegas Sands no longer operating in the city of Las Vegas. They're Macau only. But we still have really hot activities here in the US when it comes to gambling, be it in Las Vegas or be it in Boston Harbor. And therefore, I like win more than LVS. And we look at the performance since uh, last October. Win is at performing LVS by a lot. Win in yellow. LVS in blue. Win resorts. Gains of almost 100%. LVS gains of almost 64%. In any case, maybe somebody's betting that LVS will catch up to the win now that we have China reopening, and they bought the 63 calls for the expiration date March 31st with expectations that LVS will gain more than 7.5% by then. They paid around 70 cents apiece to enter this trade, all in all, spending around $700,000. Last but not least, what about the ticker SLG? This is for SL Green Realty, a REIT name. It pays north of 9% worth of dividend. Here's the problem, folks. Why would you take the risk. If the one year is paying me 5%, I'll take that over the nine with no risk involved at all. Because the higher rates go, the Fed funds rate, bond yields, the 10 year, the lower real estate valuations will go. So why would I assume the risk for yet another 4% or so? I'll take the one year, get 5% risk free. And therefore, we're seeing a lot of weakness in rates here. Somebody's bidding that this name will go further down. And they bought the 30 bucks puts for the expiration date, May 19th, with expectations that SLG will move down or lose more than 12% of its value by then. They paid around 1.3 bucks a piece to enter this trade, all in all, spending around $1.3 million. On to the heat map, what we see here, mixed action, but it's not risk on. Technology down, the big caps are down, the reopening names mostly down, but we're also seeing the risk off segments that are yield sensitive, such as rates and utilities down big. Even though financials supposed to be beneficial from higher yields, they're down today. And therefore, I'm not so excited about financials at this point, even though I know a lot of you say, hey, yields are going higher. We got to go with financials. Maybe that is the case. But the reaction so far has been muted. We explained why that is the case. You know, if you have a recession, who cares if yields are moving higher? Loan generation will go down. The revenue from the mortgage units will go down. The revenue from uh, money markets will go down. So what is the point here? But we also see weakness in uh, high dividend paying names, mostly in the consumer defensives. Why would somebody assume the risk when you have the risk free giving you 5% plus? Even the best names, Coca-Cola. Cola, PepsiCo, General Mills, they all have pretty good dividend, but that comes with risk, and the dividend is now less than the one-year rate. Also among the underperformers, we have Tesla, we'll talk about Tesla in a minute, we have Netflix, we talked about Netflix, the uh, price decreases all over the place, that's not good for the company. Then we have Nvidia finally breaking down, when uh, Kathy Wood says it's overvalued, that's telling. The ad performers, energy, whether we're looking at SLB, the piping names, Halliburton, whether we're talking about natural gas names, made a major comeback today, whether we're talking about the 
refineries via low MPC major gains for the day. Likewise, with the China reopening optimism and the dollar is down, metals at performing, mostly gold and copper. FCX is up big time. Then we have, uh, of course, among the China reopening optimism, when we look at chips, we can see TSM moving higher, being the outlier, although Intel was higher too. Kind of weird. And then we have CRM, Ohana. That's up today. We have earnings after hours. It's up even more. It's a battlefield between activists and uh, the Ohana bullshitter, who fired a lot of workers, by the way, to save money, yet he's still paying $10 million to Matthew McConaughey. And then we also have Big Pharma, mostly in the green, not all of them, but the notable action coming from Eli Lilly. Now, we have seen a lot of uh, negative action in Eli Lilly. Lots of buying of put options, anticipating bad news for the company. Today, we got the bad news. And the bad news is, bad for the company, of course, good for us, the consumer and uh, patients. Eli Lilly will reduce the cost of insulin products by 70%. Why is the stock up? How about the phenomenon of sell the rumor, buy the news? In Tesla, we have the opposite. We have buy the rumor, sell the news. Because all in all, the event is a bust. Elon did not reveal anything exciting today, anything meaningful, anything new that we did not know about before. And therefore, the event is a bust. And Tesla's down after hours, buy the rumor, sell the news. And here's a piece of news for Novavax. This used to be one of the hottest names during the uh, Vax mania, but now the company is going out of business. Poof, gone. And the reason is the Vax mania is over. The government will not buy any more shots beyond December 23. And lastly, we have news for JP Morgan. We've been following this uh, fiasco of the involvement of JP Morgan with the Jeffrey Epstein case. And now, of course, there are a lot of calls in DC and other places calling for CEO Jamie Dimon to testify under oath about his relationship with Epstein, his bank's relationship with uh, Epstein. But of course, JP Morgan says, yeah, Jamie will talk to you, but not under oath. Can't tell the truth here. Anyways, moving on to the heat map for the ETFs. Again, the dollar is down. Combined with the China optimism, what does that do? Energy up big, XLE, XOP, OIH, all blasting higher. Gold is up, GDX, catching a bit. With that comes the XME, also moving higher. This is the metals ETF. Then we got Chinese ETFs, FXI, MCHI. And with that comes the emerging markets ETFs, the EEM, for example, up big today. The other phenomenon that we got is yields blasted higher. The 10 year is above 4% now. And therefore, the yield sensitive uh, ETFs are down, be it the XLU, utilities, real estate, IYR, VNQ, all down big. And with that, also consumer related ETFs such as retail, XRT, cyclicals, XLY down big. Why would they be down big in reaction to higher yields? The answer is more interest rate hikes means more interest rates on your credit card, on the loans you have to get. And the goal behind that is to reduce the consumption level in the economy. This is not good for retail, the XRT, certainly not good for cyclicals, the XLY. Anyhow, moving on to the charts, and then we wrap it up and we start with SPY, the S&P 500 30 minutes chart. What do we see here? Yesterday, we got a closing below 398 for the day. We talked about how negative that is as a leading indicator. And now we went down almost to the support of 393.16. Now, it could be 393 and a half, 393.4, but it is within that zone. We caught support from that zone, got a nice bounce, then a move back, maybe a retest to that number, and then bounce back by the end. Now, this action is negative all in all. The chart is consolidating in a negative pattern. It's a pullback, then consolidation around a support level, meaning that the assumption should be a continuation of the primary move, which means breaking the next support. With that being said, looking at the 30 right now, we can see that the RSI is getting really oversold. The MACD is making its way higher too, which indicates that we have the conditions for a rebound if the market chooses to rebound tomorrow. But the problem is, when we look at the daily chart for the continuous contract for the S&P, we lost an important support today, closing below 3,960. The volume continues to move higher. The negative divergences in the RSI, the MACD indicators, continue to hold, indicating that you're better off waiting for for a legitimate rebound here. If you want to do some short covering, if you want to do some dip buying or playing rebounds, maybe you want to wait till this break happens and we go down all the way to the next support of 3,855. And if we do that rapidly, the RSI, the MACD indicators will become really, really oversold, meriting a pop, a rebound, something, a reaction, which will give us the opportunity to do some short covering and maybe play the rebound. Then we take it from there. What about the queues? 30 minutes. We have a similar story here. A closing below 294.33 was a negative leading indicator and now we go down all the way to the next support almost at 290. We have a retest, a bounce, closing at the lows of the days. Not a good reaction here indicating more pain to come. But can we at least catch some sort of a rebound? The answer is it is possible because the MACD, the RSI, all oversold right now, at least in the 30. And we have negative divergence in the RSI 
RSI about to be reversed. I would not be surprised if I wake up in the morning tomorrow and I see stock market futures up. But will that last? The answer is probably not. And the reason is when we look at the daily chart for the continuous contract for the Qs, it is now moving away from the resistance of 12,207. As of the chart saying, hey, I don't have the energy to do it right now and the bear flag is going to play out, I need to go down to another support level and the next thing I see is 11,689. The volume is moving higher. The uh, momentum indicators are in negative divergences, all indicating that we're going to go down to 11,689. The question becomes, are we going to do it in one shot or after maybe a mini rebound or two? IWM, Russell 2000, 30 minutes chart, the best hope for the bulls right now. And the reason is it did close above the support line of 188. And if we use this as a leading indicator, that means the Qs and the SPY will also rebound at least in the morning. Now we have a lot of soft support between uh, 188 to 191 and a half, which is the hard resistance that we have right now. And the number is actually a little below 191 and a half. It's actually 191.443, something like that. I'm just rounding it up for simplicity. The point being is if the IWM loses 188 again, that will seal the deal right away and will actually be a leading indicator that the SPY and the Qs, they will flush down all the way to the next supports that we just talked about. Dixie, an hourly chart. What's going on here? We talked about the impact of China reopening, the Yuan moved higher, the Aussie moved higher, the Kiwi moved higher, the Euro moved higher, and therefore the dollar was under pressure. But it did make a comeback. Although faced resistance at almost my number of 104.58, it gave it a shot once, didn't happen, gave it another shot. Could third time be a charm? And again, if the dollar makes it above this um, resistance, turning it into support, I don't think the algos are going to receive that warmly. We're talking about the algos for the SPY and the Qs. But we might see more weakness here in the dollar because when we look at the daily chart for the Dixie, what do we see? The momentum indicator is a weakening, be it the RSI or the MACD indicator. The chart did lose one soft support today. If the weakness continues, it could be a catalyst for a rebound in the equities market. But my hunch is the algos are now following yields more than the dollar. What if we have the phenomenon of the dollar cooling off, but yields continuing to move higher? Then your concentration as a trader should be on the yield sensitive sector of the stock market, not the dollar one, meaning not chips, not technology, but more utilities, real estate, the consumer defensives, the dividend names, those kind of names, maybe you want to concentrate in those instead. And if the dollar cools off, what about the old man? Gold caught a bit today, but it did not close above the important number of 1,842. Most importantly, of course, is the weekly closing. Is it going to happen above the number or below? Above means so far so good. Gold is going to move higher. Dollar is going to be weaker all the way to the FOMC. And if that is the case, there will be good news for oil. We're talking about Brent here, daily chart. It's about to face 85 again. If it succeeds and it closes above 85 for the week, then we will be anticipating a higher high to come. Once that happens in the pattern, then so far so good for oil bulls. Higher we go. Now we're going to talk about 90, 95, even going all the way back to 100. It's too early for that conversation right now. Here it is, the 10 year. It made it all the way to 4. Now the question becomes, is it going to close above or below 4 by the end of the week? Above, more pain to come for these sensitive sectors to higher yields. Below, maybe we'll give a little bit of hope that we could see a rebound in utilities, real estate, consumer defensives, and maybe some of the technology names. When we look at the two year yield already made it to the target of around 4.88 now what now it's going to hold is it going to close above it below it by the end of the day end of the week it is in extended territory when it comes to the momentum indicators be it the rsi or the macd the question now becomes the two year is trading almost at the same level it was trading at back in november how come the equities market did not go all the way back at least closer to the same levels of october slash november of last year are equities lagging if that is the case that we got more pain to come, at least in the queues. TLT bouncing again. And it did close above the important number, 100.28. We'll see what happens. But my hunch is if yields close the week above four, we will see more pain to come in the TLT. In the case of the TLT, will it close above 100.28 by the end of the week or below? These weekly closing are really important because they serve as leading indicators. Another important one would be the VIX. We have to adjust the channel right now because the chart made a lower low. So we know that we have a sloping channel. The question now becomes, will the VIX close above or below 20 by the end of the week? Above 20, the bears are still in charge. Below 20, maybe the bulls will make a comeback, a rebound for a day or two, maybe a week or so. And then down we go again. And the reason is the weekly charts for the VIX moving from bearish to bullish momentum. The same goes for the Dixie. The same goes for the 10-year yield. So we know in the long run, we're going down in equities because of these leading indicators. But in the short run, can we catch a rebound? It is possible. And here's Apple, 30 minutes. What do we see here? All the 
the way down to the support of 145. Now what? Will the support hold or not by the end of the week? Again, these are all important numbers. Will Apple close above 145 by the end of the week or below? When we look at the daily chart, it already closed below the gap. It is in negative divergence from the RSI and the MACD. And sooner or later, Apple will go down all the way to the next support, which I have it at 138.5. That will be a downside of about 4.5% from this point on. That leads us. I've been talking about buying the 145 puts for March expiration, March 17th, that is. And I did open the trade back on Valentine's Day, February 14th. And back then, the contract was at about two bucks a piece, a little below that, but let's call it two bucks. Now the contract is trading at around 3.2 bucks a piece. So this is a good profit for now. The question becomes how do we manage the trade? You can take your profits, you can do that and say goodbye, or you can also turn it into calendar spread by opening, let's say, the 145 with the expiration date of this Friday, and you can collect around uh, one buck a piece that reduces the entry cost all the way down to one buck a piece. The risk with this is what if Apple closes the week below 145? So you're only going to do this if you're positive that Apple is going to close above 145 by the end of the week. That way you can take the one buck a piece, that's your credit now, and you reduce the entry cost to one buck a piece for the original contract. All in all, this strategy doubles your gains. The other strategy is you can open a debit spread. This is the um, grid for March 17th. The contract that we have is 145. These are the puts. The 140, for example, is trading at one and a half bucks a piece. You can sell those and capture the credit, and this is going to reduce your entry cost to about 50 bucks a piece. The risk with this is it limits your gains. Let's say Apple continues to go down big in the next few weeks. It goes all the way down to 135. Now your gains are capped to five bucks a piece. But a reminder, your entry cost is now 50 cents a piece if you do sell the 140 puts for the expiration date of March 17th, meaning your maximum gain is 1000%. Not bad at all. This is the mature way of dealing with the trade. You can also use another strategy, which is rolling down. So you can close the 145 and you get the three bucks or so worth of credit. And then you can open double the position by buying the 140 puts this time around, which will cost you about one and a half bucks a piece. Or you can roll down to the 140, open the same number of contracts that you have right now for the 145 and it will cost you half that way half of the profit you made from the 145 puts that's in the bag now you play with the house money so these are three strategies on how to manage the trade right now number one using a calendar spread strategy number two using a debit spread strategy number three rolling down to the 140 instead what about tesla and hourly chart what do we see here we talked about the abc pattern that took place but we got a rebound at around 200 so far so good the problem is it is a bear flag consolidation pattern so down we go and after hours the name is down big we have 194.55 as support number one and if that doesn't hold then we have support all the way down at 180 bitcoin and daily chart what do we see here again consolidating in a bear flag pattern if the buyers don't show up the sellers are gonna and down we go so it's running out of time right now the buyers must step in right now we have uh, china reopening optimism we have hong kong optimism we have singapore optimism something gotta pop it higher otherwise the sellers are going to say, okay, enough. This is not moving. Let's just book profits and go home. Speaking of going home, let's wrap it up here. And what do we have on the economic calendar tomorrow? We have initial jobless claims, and then we have revisions for productivity and unit labor costs. Usually, we don't pay a lot of attention to revisions, but recently, the revisions have been really massive, and therefore, we have to pay attention to those. Then we got Governor Waller speaking, along with part number two from Minneapolis Fed President Neil Kashkari. And with that, folks, this is all I got for you for tonight. Thank you for listening. Thank you for watching. I will talk to you again tomorrow. Good night. Oh, he's a uh, pussy kid from next door. I'm just trying to man him up a little bit. Mm. You see, kid? Now that's how guys talk to one another. <laughs>